Thank you so much. It's great to be back at the University of Oregon. It feels like my earliest days at the University of Oregon, in fact. Uh, except for one exception, which is I cannot remember a time that I would have ever found myself in a lecture hall on a Friday night. <laughs> Wouldn't have happened under any circumstance. Uh, when I came to the University of Oregon, it was like coming to a whole new world. Uh, I came from Eastern Oregon, and there were so many people to meet and get to know and activities to engage with and connect with uh, that it was very exciting and it was something totally new to me. And, you know, this is, this is what I think about why college is important. It's something we have to ask ourselves. Why is college so important? What's really important about it? And what I think is college is really important because college is like a community. And communities are at the center of so many things that we do. Learning doesn't just happen in the classroom. Learning is happening when you're having a rambling conversation with a new friend in the Bean Complex, or you're playing Frisbee out in front of Night Library. There are all sorts of places that learning is happening and community is happening. And actually brings me to my very first connection with the uh, Colleges of Arts and Sciences. As a freshman, I took a freshman seminar. And many of you guys may know and be familiar with this. It's a, they bring in freshman students, young 18-year-olds usually, and they connect with senior tenured professors who talk about provocative, thought-provoking sort of material that helps onboard these students into, the, into, community, into university life. And for me, I don't know if it was just by a stroke of good luck or my own discerning tastes, I think it was probably my good luck, uh, I was able to find myself in a class, a freshman seminar, called Community in the Modern World. And it was uh, instructed by a professor named Will Davey. Will Davey, of course, being a University of Oregon professor, demanded only be known as Will. And he did a great job of inspiring this group of young students to be able to explore and discuss how societies organize themselves into communities and what the dynamics of those communities are. And one of the things that I recall our class arriving, and I think it was the principal takeaway of the course, was that connection and increased authentic participation can equate to influence inside of a community. Connection and authentic participation in a community can equal influence. And it was impossible for us in that freshman seminar to not also get the takeaway that there's a lot of responsibility that goes along uh, with the influence in a community. And so as I went on from the University of Oregon and started doing some of my first early work right out of college, I worked on campaigns and government. And certainly that principal takeaway of that course proved to be very, very helpful. Uh, I went to work and had the good fortune of working with some really cool people. Um, and I think this is important. I should go back to mention that, that what we're seeing is that people are able to share these experiences in their life and be able to gain influence in community. And certainly that was the case uh, with some of my early work on the campaign trail and in government. And it was actually principally what we were doing. Uh, Senator Gordon Smith was an entrepreneur and a successful businessman. And that provided an entree for his story into running for the U.S. Senate, which is where I worked for him. Senator, Senator McCain was a prisoner of war, an American hero, a Navy pilot. Uh, Meg Whitman was a pioneering woman CEO, a manager, a fixer, revered. Um, and while I had the good fortune of working with these folks and learning a lot from them, and, and their, stor their stories and personal stories were certainly impressive that allowed them to gain influence in, in the community. The reality is they're, they're the types of influencers that you would run across on, throughout the past. And the dynamics and characteristics of community are changing because the world is changing. Right now, uh, 2.7 billion people are connected to the Internet. And another three billion are going to be connected to the internet by the end of the decade. 
And what we're seeing, and this is something that we, we talk quite a lot about at Facebook because it's had a dramatic effect on, on the way that our business is, has uh, progressed, is, this is an important takeaway, which is it took 84 years for 100 million fixed line telephone subscriptions to exist, but only 34 years for 6 billion mobile subscriptions to exist. This line is straight up, I mean literally straight up and to the right, and it's dramatically changing the way that people are connecting and organizing. I remember when I was a sophomore at the University of Oregon, I had a cell phone that looked like a candy bar, had all sorts of buttons, and the only thing you could do with it is make a phone call. And right now, I was a sophomore before I had it, and it was a rarity that a, that a kid in, uh, in college had a cell phone at that time. And right now, I have to believe that 99.9 .9 all students at this university have a mobile phone, in fact, a supercomputer that they're keeping in their pocket. And it's changing the, the way that people are connecting and organizing. It's, it's dramatically uh, increasing the level of engagement that people are able to have with communities and communities that they're building themselves through the internet, through social networks, through mobile phones. People are able to build influential communities of their own. There's this concept referred to as Zuck's Law, although I can assure you that Mark does not refer to it as Zuck's Law. It's the idea that people are sharing twice as much every single year as we move forward. Facebook is almost 10 years old, and every single year we see people on Facebook sharing twice as much as they did in the years in the past. And the data, the data confirms it. What we're actually seeing is 4.75 billion pieces of content created every single day. We're seeing uh, over, over 4 billion likes, 350 million photos uploaded to the, to the internet every single day. In fact, by one estimate, in the last two years, there's been more recorded information than in the entirety of history before it. And that's a really important thing to consider. What is all that information doing? How are, how are we able to connect with it? And how, are peop how is it changing the way that these communities exist? Well, the, I'd like to kind of walk through a few examples that I've gotten to have a front seat kind of seeing um, my course of time working in, at Facebook. Uh, one of them um, is an Indian entrepreneur named Karthik. Karthik kind of ran into not a totally extraordinary, but heartfelt challenge in that a friend of his had uh, a four-year-old daughter who was seeking a blood transfusion. And he realized that this was, he was watching as this, this Young, young girl was suffering from this genetic disease and having a difficult time getting a blood transfusion. So what he did was he created a Facebook app. And the Facebook app allows people to be able to profess their blood type and then get matched with recipients. And today, this, is, this socialblood.org, which he created, is operating in over 20 countries, and thousands of people's lives have been saved and changed as a result of Karthik and his entrepreneurial spirit and the influence that he's been able to build inside this community. There's another example that I'd like to talk about, which you guys all remember, that in April, uh, there was a devastating tornado that went through Oklahoma. Um, there was a woman named Leslie Hagelberg, and Leslie Hagelberg lived in, lives in West Tulsa. After the tornado, she found all of this debris around her house and in her neighborhood, photographs and documents, all sorts of things that people would definitely want to have, but they have now lost forever because these documents are strewn about who's to say who these people are or where these documents come from. So what she did, she created a Facebook page, and within a couple days, 7,000 people had liked it and joined it. She was taking pictures of photos and documents and returning them to their families so that these memories were not lost forever, that literally generations down the line will be able to enjoy the memories that might have been lost. And this is now a community of people that she knows and can actually uh, connect with and, and influence. A normal person like Leslie. And probably the most dramatic example, and I think is relevant um, on a larger scale, is a gentleman by the name of Carlos Guevara. Carlos Guevara is a 33-year-old, or was a 33-year-old civil engineer in Colombia. And 
he was frustrated with the unchecked violence that was being propagated um, by the revolutionary, um, uh, armed, the armed revolutionary uh, of forces of Colombia, FARC. So he created this Facebook group called One Million Voices Against FARC. FARC, unchecked for five decades of violence and kidnappings, and on February 4th of 2008, he organized in 20 cities in Colombia and 104 cities around the world, hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people marching in opposition to FARC. Lots of mainstream media attention, lots of external pressures put on the government in Colombia, and shortly thereafter, although months thereafter, uh, you saw that the Colombian government took military action to free uh, 15 prisoners, uh, including Ingram Bencourt, who was a former presidential candidate. And there was this large-scale success. It was, this was 2008. I mean, there were only 100 million people on Facebook at this time. Right now, there are over 1.2 billion people on Facebook at this time. At this, at this point in 2008, Twitter is, is not even really uh, a relevant tool for people at this point. And so to see this large-scale demonstration as a result of, of this lone Facebook page that a random, for all intents and purposes, civil engineer in Columbia created is really dramatic. And he was speaking at the Clinton Global Institute, I believe it was, and he said this medium allowed him to touch hearts and minds at scale to be able to create change. And here's an individual that really should have no standing in the traditional world of the Gordon Smith, John McCain, Meg Whitman world of being able to have these sort of entree stories at scale. As an aside, actually, uh, I was with John McCain meeting with President Uribe at the time that uh, the Colombian government took action. It's a random story, but I think it's interesting and it kind of shows a collision of things. We're pulling out of Cartagena, Colombia, uh, on the Straight Talk Express jet and Sitting next to me is the interpreter, who's a family friend of the McCain's, his name is Andy, and he gets a text on his phone. And it is telling us the news that they're going to announce that they've you know, deployed this military action and have freed these prisoners. So we're sitting there in these seats and we don't know what to do with this information, but we figured we better go tell Senator McCain. So we went up to the front of the plane, we were back with the National Press Corps, and I remember vividly, like it was yesterday, walking into the partition where the senator usually was. And uh, Senators McCain, Lieberman, and Graham were with us on this trip to Latin America. And Lindsey Graham had already begun to bed down for the trip. And we walked in and we told him what, what we had learned. We called this impromptu press conference at the front of the plane. You know, the New York Times, AP, Fox, CNN, everybody's there. And they talk about how important this military action was and how important it is to reinitiate a free trade agreement with Colombia, which was why we had visited to meet with President Uribe. It was kind of the news of the day. And the funny thing is, at that time, as I mentioned, Twitter and Facebook, you know, these things are not really being adopted as a broadcast method, mechanism by journalists. So we, or actually me, by myself namely, had to manage the, the phone on the plane that the journalists had to use to call back to their bureaus to then distribute the news of this press conference all through old line mechanisms so that news could be distributed. Now, of course, today, these guys would all be tweeting the moment that it looked like somebody was scurrying up to the front of the plane. There would be misinterpretations about the news, all sorts of things, I, you know. <laughs> but things are happening direct to consumer. Um, so we think about these things, and, and it's... It's nice, I, th I think, to think about how important this stuff is and how important it is to all of us. Um, I think we're the connected generation. I think the generations before us uh, didn't live in a world where we were building our own networks of influence uh, as easily and connecting with so many different people. And I think that uh, the generations ahead of us won't experience this change. This is a, this is a world that they'll grow up in. In fact, Ian and I were talking earlier, and he mentioned that he was able to connect with old friends on Facebook, but the next generation won't connect with old friends on Facebook because all their friends will be on Facebook. There won't be any long-lost connections that are made. 
And it's, you think about that context, and it's easy to think of how nice that is and how important that is. But actually, we're enjoying that because we're in the developed world. We, on average, spend 1% to 2% of our income on the data connection for our mobile phone or supercomputer that we keep in our hip pocket. In the developing world, people are spending one-fourth of their paycheck, 25%. Data is very expensive and very difficult to transmit. And in the developing world, people, uh, we're looking at three, 3 billion people that remain still uh, not having access to this type of connection. And so that's our responsibility, and we need to think about it. I was actually had the good fortune of being able to work on internet.org, which is a project that Mark Zuckerberg is spearheaded with other mobile technology companies to try and connect the next 3 billion people in the next five years. And it's a really cool project. And when you think about what we're experiencing as a result of this connectivity, being closer to the things that we care about most, being able to get information that used to be uh, only ha only people had access that only a select few people had access to that has now been widespread. And finally, the most important thing I think, which is the ability to build networks and communities of influence based on connection and authentic participation that really had only been enjoyed by these elected officials and, and anointed leaders previously. That's really exciting stuff. And it brings me to my closing point, which is, you know, I've gone through every step of my career to this point has been focused on the participation and understanding and discovery of communities and how they relate and how influence surfaces inside them. And it all goes back to philosophy 199, Will Davy, and understanding exactly how small communities might exist in the modern world. We're talking about 1997. Facebook, Twitter, all of these mechanisms did not exist at that time. I did not have a cell phone at that time. And to have the grounding and understanding of community and those dynamics has made all the difference. And it reminds me how important it is for us to connect, participate, and support this place, the University of Oregon, where even people are learning about the world that's unfolding in front of them. Yeah. It's been really important for me, and uh, thank you so much. Go Ducks!